Welcome everyone. Welcome to ABLA's employment update. Uh, today we're going to talk about casual employment, IR reform and returning to work post-COVID close downs. Joining me today is Lewis Izzo, our Managing Director, City Workplace. Welcome, Lewis. Hi, Joe. Uh, it's been a while since I've seen you face to face. It has so, been a while. So good to see you. It has been a while. Um, we, and as Lewis has just said that because we are still uh, out of the office at the moment. Um, we don't have anyone working in the office, although we might have to make visits in when we've got um, litigated matters and other bits and pieces. Um, today is... Uh, I'll just grab the controller. Today we're going to cover off, as I've already said, on casual employment. Um, that's a really hot topic. This is, um, uh, you know, uh, been an issue for a number of years now. Uh, a lot of people are, um, uh, have sent through quite a few questions asking us about the Rosato decision, the work pack and Rosato decision. And we're going to talk about that in some detail. And then we're going to talk about some of the challenges. We've got lots of questions we're going to uh, run through because I think we'll find those questions to be uh, very helpful for everyone who's online. Um, that, of course, post uh, followed the Skeen and Workpack decision. Um, and we'll talk about that as well. Uh, we're going to talk about the upcoming IR reform agenda by the current government. Um, they're already engaged with the ACTU and various other parties uh, for the purposes of starting those discussions. Um, we'll have a talk about what what that looks like at the moment. We don't know what it'll look like at the other end, but we'll have a talk about what that looks like. And then um, we're going to give you an update on uh, uh, issues around employees returning to work post COVID. And we've got piles of questions that we're going to run through. Um, so we've given ourselves a little bit of extra time today. Hopefully we'll get to some of the questions that come through on the uh, website. So you'll note that there's a spot there for you where you can send questions through. Uh, we'll toggle between our, the questions we've already been sent pre uh, pre-event and also the ones that come through today and we'll do our best to get to um, some interesting questions and as always we always try and come back to you later on um, in answer to any of your questions that come through. Right well Lewis, casual employment developments, we've, we've been bleeding about this for um, very hard for the last three years. Um, we, we did uh, uh, a number of workplace updates where we sort of we do our um, Usually, we haven't done it this year because of COVID. Yes. We do our trip up and down the East Coast, usually and over to South Australia, um, to talk to businesses about um, what's happening in employment law. And uh, about three years ago, we ran um, two sessions in a row to, or two periods in a row. We ran that on casuals, and that was a little prophetic because at that time, uh, Skeen hadn't arrived and neither had uh, the uh, Rosato decision. Um, but now we have them, and the reality of what we were saying at the time and warning people about has hit. Yeah. Um, so I, I might ask you, you're, you, you've, you've spent a lot of time. I, I have read this decision, but Lewis has read all 280 pages of this decision in quite some detail. Um, and he's very, very uh, involved in the detail. Uh, so uh, we're, 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 you know, he's the, the Mr. Rosato man, as far as I'm concerned. I'm sure the lawyers who ran the case are quite detailed. Uh, quite across the detail, but Lewis, I would, I, I put my money on Lewis to be across the detail. Mate, why don't you run us through that a bit? Yeah, sure. So, um, in the Rosato decision, we effectively had a, a longish term casual, three and a half years of engagement that was uh, driving in and driving out to various client sites on behalf of his employer, Workpack. He was engaged on six separate contracts of employment that stated that um, he was a casual employee. They provided for a 25% casual loading that was to be paid in lieu of permanent employment entitlements. Um, the, the contracts were actually very specific in the sense that the 25% loading was actually broken down and they attributed, attributed various elements of the loading to different types of permanent employment entitlements. Um, he was engaged on rosters in advance because he was drive in, drive out, as you can imagine, he needed to be provided with accommodation. His first engagement, he was given a roster that had um, working hours for the next seven months outlined in the roster. And then after that, he was um, put on various other client sites where he was actually in receipt of, on multiple occasions, 12-month rosters in advance that were published kind of towards the end of the year. Um, towards the end of his engagement, um, or, or sorry, post his engagement, he filed this claim. And, and the claim was effectively um, that he was a permanent employee for the duration of his employment, notwithstanding that the employee and employer had agreed that he was casual, had paid him a casual loading, 
and that this had never been raised during the employment relationship. Um, if we, I'd like to drill back on some of the findings when we talk about the, the kind of precedent value of this case, but if we kind of jump to the federal court's findings, um, the federal court reiterated some of the language that we've been talking about, as Joe mentioned, for a number of years, and that is what the parties describe the relationship as does not determine the nature of the relationship. Just because you call an employer casual does not mean that he or she necessarily is casual. Um, equally, just because you pay the employee a casual loading does not necessarily mean that they are casual. You need to look at all features of the employment relationship. And then we're getting um, these particular phrases coming out that are really at the crux of whether someone's casual or not. And, and there's two key phrases that the judgments repeat ad nauseum, and that is that a casual is someone who has no firm advance commitment from the employer to continuing an indefinite work. But again, whether someone has firm advance commitment isn't determined by what the parties say to each other. You look for indicators of whether a firm advance commitment exists. And those indicators are primarily um, if someone has irregular work patterns, uncertainty, discontinu discontinuity, intermittency of work and unpredictability, those are the indicators that are likely to suggest that someone has no firm advance commitment. And what you put in your contracts might colour that and certainly might assist in understanding whether someone's casual or not, but really you've got to look at the totality of the relationship before understanding whether there's a firm advance commitment or not. And when they looked at all of that, they formed the view that Mr Rosato was not a casual but a permanent and accordingly he was entitled to unpaid leave entitlements and entitled to um, to public holiday payments that he hadn't received when he wasn't working the public holidays. Um, if, if we stop things there, most of all of that is what happened in the scheme decision. Mm. And, and, jo and Joe and I have been, been kind of talking about that scheme decision for a while. What really distinguishes the Rosado case is that Mr Rosado then ran two counterclaims. Sorry, I take that back. Mr Workpack ran two counterclaims that were not run in scheme. And the, the first was that even if Mr Rosato is a casual employee, or sorry, a permanent employee, um, Workpack had the ability to reclaim the casual loading pay because it had paid that loading by way of mistake. And because it had paid that casual loading in error, it should be able to recover the monies and have those monies offset any claim that, to unpaid leave entitlement. The court unanimously rejected that type of counterclaim and said you didn't pay the money under any mistake. You said in your contract you intended to pay a casual loading. You paid it. Um, you said it was in lieu of or instead of leave entitlements. You assumed that that would satisfy your obligations under the Act, but it didn't. But, but that doesn't mean you paid the loading in mistake and accordingly you can't recover the loading on that basis. The second element of their claim, which you'll see at the top of the slide there, was that Workpack said, well, in any event, the casual loading was in lieu of these leave entitlements, so we should be able to say we no longer owe the leave entitlements. We've satisfied that obligation. And for a whole range of reasons, multiple reasons, the court kind of smacked that one to the curb and, and dispatched the, the, the argument with uh, a fair amount of rigour. Um, Firstly, they said, well, no, you paid the loading in lieu of the leave entitlements. That is, you didn't say you satisfied the leave entitlements, you paid it instead of them. Now, that's a little bit cute, but, but in any event, um, the court said you just simply couldn't have paid him those leave entitlements. Some of the loading was paid in advance. He, never, he was never paid the monies at the time the leave was to be taken or paid out. There was no real nexus or correlation between the leave and the public holiday entitlements and when he got the loading. And so the offsetting claim failed as well. And so um, the two defensive mechanisms, if you like, the two um, triggers that might have been available for employers to rely on the loading that had previously been paid clearly are not available in order to defend it against these types of claims. And that's the development, Joe, that, that probably wasn't around earlier. We didn't know that that was going to be the case, but no. now we do. Well, I, th I think, um, and one of our questions I know was... Um uh, I had a quick look at it last night, 
And one of the questions was, well, is this, you know, OK, so this is what's happened in Rosato. Um, we've got a, a guy who knew 12 months in advance what his roster was going to be, had a very firm advance commitment um, about the work he was going to perform. He was working the same roster patterns as the, the full-time permanent employees on the site. Mm. Um, there were a whole lot of a whole range of things that made him pretty obviously not a casual in the common law sense of the word. Um, and so the question was, do we um, is it really does this mean that this is panic stations in relation to all casual employees who are performing work on a, a pretty regular basis? Yeah, and um, it's that's a, that's an area of some passion for me because, there's two particular things in the work pack case that, that really do stand out. And I think I think all employers need to take stock of this. I mean, not only did he have these long rosters, but in fact, um, Mr Rosato um, was obliged under his contractual terms to indeed pay damages to work pack if he didn't turn up to shifts um, mm -hmm. as per the um, as per the roster. Now, that kind of makes him more permanent than you and I, Joe. I mean, if, if I don't turn up to work one day, you might wonder where I am. But, but I've never, um, never thought that I might be served with a summons for, for damages to be paid to my employer because I wasn't there. And, and so this casual relationship really doesn't sound quite, quite so casual. And so I do think there is merit in employers saying, well, hang on a second, to what extent does this actually... Um, mean that my casuals, who might be regular and systematic, are automatically deemed permanent. And I think that's a, that's a, um, that's a real tension that employers need to grapple with. And, and we, we deal with this in a, in a slide or two, but I might just make this point now. You really do need to think about, even if I have regular employees, that doesn't necessarily mean they're permanent. Um, you, you might have a variety of employers that still have um, shifts that are subject to demand, they might be subject, subject to funding, they might be subject to seasons. Um, they might be subject to all sorts of um, delicate variations or mild fluctuations in demand. That means you, you can't with certainty say that there are going to be particular shifts next week, even if there's a pattern for some time. Don't automatically assume that Workpack and Rosado and Workpack and Scheme mean that your employee is automatically permanent. It might be the case that you can distinguish your circumstances. But I suppose what we're going to talk about later is you still want to be ensuring you have appropriate measures in place to mitigate your Absolutely. exposure to risk. Um, I think... Sorry, yes. Well, I was just going to say, um, in relation to uh, this particular point about employers uh, not, not overreacting, um, but at the same time... Uh, they should be putting in place measures. And, and after Skeen, we went away and reviewed our contracts and, and reissued our casual contracts, and we've just done that again. Mm. Um, so we've, we've updated the contracts that we provide for casuals to contemplate what was said in Rosato, which is pretty much what we do when a decision comes out is we look at our contracts and go, well, do we need to change our contracts? And sometimes we do and sometimes we don't. Um, with, I, I think it's important to, to, just to point out... Um, Part of the reason that uh, Workpack pressed this decision, because it seems bleedingly obvious that this fellow was not casual when you look at it and when you read the decisions, um, when we go back a little bit, um, quite a few years actually, uh, there had been a divergence in the approach. And we, we talked about this before, and I just want to quickly deal with Tellum very briefly, where um, the uh, there had been a divergence in views about how casuals operated in Australian workplaces. And on one view, we had casuals who um, operated under the common law and, and were not covered by um, an industrial instrument, whether that's a modern award or an enterprise agreement. And then we had people who were casuals who engaged under a modern award or an enterprise agreement who are engaged and paid as such. And, that, and because they're engaged as a casual and called a casual and paid 25% loading, the employers at that point in time took the view that, in fact, that means that, well, they are a casual employee. And this was reinforced by a series of um, Fair Work Commission Fair decisions work, yes. and, um, in fact, a full bench decision um, by the Fair Work Commission um, uh, where they had found that, in fact, that was the case. Provided you uh, are, uh, have an employee who's covered by an industrial instrument who is engaged and paid as such, um, then they are 
a casual. And so that, that infected a whole range of industries or at least validated them from a casual perspective. And that is why they took that, that's why they took that view. Um, at, but it has created um, a, a range of problems for a whole range of industries, even though we, 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 we are also saying, let's not overreact as employers. Yeah. At the same time, there are some employers out there, employers out there that do run businesses where they do have a firm advance commitment for employees. They do work in a manner that really suggests that they're only casuals because the employer seems to think that paying them a 25% loading is a better option for the business than, um, than uh, accruing leave for them, or because the uh, part-time arrangements or full-time arrangements under an award do not provide the flexibility that a casual provides. Um, and that, that brings us to this discussion about where we end up yeah. with the reforms. And I think this is the other thing. Um, it's a highly fluid environment at the moment. There is a, there is a real prospect, not, not a certainty, but a real prospect of an appeal to the High Court um, about uh, the, some of the, the rulings in the Rosado decision, particularly perhaps the ability to recover the mistake in loading. And even if a High Court appeal doesn't overturn the Rosado decision, there is definitely a prospect of legislative, legislative reform. And, and, you know, reform options could range from the, the government introducing into the Fair Work Act a definition of casual so that um, it can be clear that if you designate someone as a casual, then they are, in fact, a casual. Um, or alternatively, something that's being talked about a little bit now is an exemption-type provision that's triggered by casual conversion. And... Um, what you could have is a scenario where employees have refused to convert over to permanency. Perhaps that can then create an exemption that, well, from that point onwards, the employees can't claim to be permanent. And, and that's something that might get traction over the next six months. Um, alternatively, there's still a prospect that perhaps the government might mandate that any casual loading paid can be used to be satisfied against leave claims that might arise later on down the track. So. There is a possible, perhaps even probable, I don't know, you've got to be very game about saying something's probable in this current political environment, but certainly a real possibility that over the next six months the, the headache employers are finding that they're grappling with in relation to casuals might be fixed in some way. So you should bear that in mind before leaping to action. And I think on the next slide we, we talk about what you might want to do. Um, I might just say a couple of things about um, about two of these points, yes, just yeah. very briefly. Um, I, the, the debate about casual employees at the moment is um, some employer groups are asking for a definition that's consistent with the one that appeared in awards and some enterprise agreements, but they're engaged and paid as such. I think it needs to be something more than that, and the, and the full court have actually indicated it needs to be something more than that, even though they haven't dealt with that in detail. Um, the, uh, and in re this relation to, to this issue of the offsetting thing, we should mention, because people are going to be thinking, didn't the government do that? Oh, yeah. So um, the, the government did try that in a regulation, and we thought when it was brought in that it wasn't done very well at the time and there was question marks about whether or not it was enforceable. It, it's not enforceable now. Um, the, the, the decision, this decision, Rosato, has dealt with that. Yes. Fairly and squarely put a spear through it very clearly. Um, on the basis of the issue about this paid in lieu. Um, so um, you need to go back to the... Government needs to go back to the drawing board about that one. Um, so I just wanted to add that because I thought people would be thinking, well, yeah. you know, no, that, that did the government have a crack at this? Yeah, the regulation has been killed. But And I suppose the point about that is that the government, they had a crack but not a really meaningful crack, I suppose, in the sense that they, there was a bit of window dressing in the regulation and didn't really get employers to where they needed to be in terms of protected from liability and something that we said from day one. So now if they are going to actually put in something about the casual loading being able to be used, they need to deal with it more mm. substantively. Um, that brings us to our um, things that people, that need, businesses need to be doing. Yeah, and I think, um, I think our, our first point, but I think we've already dealt with this specific slide, which is whether it, it automatically applies to your business. Um, I agree, um, I think we've dealt with that, but when you get to what should you really be, be doing, I suppose the first thing to think about is to actually have a narrative about whether or not your casuals do fit into the same bucket as the work pack casuals or not. And, and they, they, that narrative is going to be influenced by the types of things we've talked about before, about 
the rostering in work packs scenario. It, it'll talk about the, the types of provisions that are in the contract. And you can probably come up with quite a plausible scenario in many ways for some of businesses as to why your casuals might be in a different scenario. The other thing that you need to think about when you develop your, your narrative is, well, even if there might be some question mark, we're in a highly fluid environment. The, the government might be changing this any time. There might be a High Court appeal. So, the, so there's a lot of things you can say to your staff in relation to why, well, it's not quite appropriate to be changing things now or, or mm. overreacting in that sense. So I think that is the first and foremost thing you need to be thinking about. Um, there are then other things that you can do as well, which pertain to the contract drafting mm. and which pertain to, to casual conversion. That's it. And we've talked about that before and made that, that's been some of our, our two main recommendations is st even though the full court in this decision um, took the contract apart and rendered it largely useless, um, it, it is still really important that you have the contract. Um, if you behave in a manner that's completely inconsistent with the contract, then that's going to be a problem. Mm. But get the contract in place and make sure it's a contract that actually contemplates or says the right things and feeds into your narrative. Um, the second thing is this um, casual conversion approach, and that is um, make sure you're complying with your casual conversion obligations under the awards for a start. You should be just doing that anyway. But on top of that, um, consider whether or not you want to use it. I was talking to a business only yesterday, um, and uh, the client that I spoke to said to me, yes, we went through and did a casual conversion offer. They decided to proactively offer their staff casual um, casual conversion. Um, that she said that they got a, a small number of people that came forward. Those people then read, uh, they were really just confused actually is why they came forward. And they really, they found out they were going to lose 20% um, of their pay um, because the loading was coming off, the 25% loading was coming off. And so they were going to lose 20% of their overall pay. And they weren't particularly interested at that point in time. That feeds into the, the potential reform of having this um, arrangement whereby if someone agrees to or doesn't want to agree, doesn't want to take up casual conversion that they acknowledge and are prevented from claiming, you know, a payment later on. Because at the moment there's still a risk around that. There is still, it is still risky. Um, if you offer casual conversion, the person rejects it, that doesn't deal with your risk um, completely. No, no. And, and I suppose the one thing is the work pack and Skeen and work pack and Rosado cases, casual conversion was not, was not involved in either of those cases. So, the court did not have a scenario involving casual conversion. No. So we certainly we certainly think it's something that can help you yeah. to defend a claim, but is it a guaranteed, um, does it give you a guaranteed outcome that someone is not a casual no. or not a permanent? No. It doesn't. Yeah. yeah. Right. Contracts, how do you mitigate? We've already talked a bit about this. So we've, we, 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 we've, I've already recommended that um, get your contracts in place. They're not a guaranteed protection, but you must have them in place. Um, you still need to have a mechanism to, to reclaim the loading. Now, our, our previous drafting um, has now been dealt with by the, the full court. We thought we were being smart and we could get around it. But now that Rosato has run, um, it dealt with a broader range of issues because they weren't raised or weren't able to be dealt with in the, um, in the Skeen decision. Um, they've now been dealt with by the full court. So we've now drafted new provisions to deal with that as well. Um, you, you need to take a great, great a, a huge amount of care before approaching existing workers with new contracts. Mm. Um, you don't want um, it to come across like you are uh, strong arming your employees into into taking new contracts. Um, having said that, if they're casuals, their engagements technically are supposed to come to an end. Um, well, their employment's supposed to come to an end after each engagement, and so technically, I suppose, offering them new contracts. Um, before the next engagement is is technically okay. But if you're one of those businesses that has a contract in place and people have been working under that contract for years, then what you're going to have is employees saying, well, hang on, what's wrong with our current contracts? My recommendation would be um, transparency and say to them that at the moment, the only way we continue to, to, to operate this way, uh, and that is paying you a loading and treating you as a casual, is that um, we need that. We want to put these arrangements in place, and just have a an honest, transparent discussion with them about it. Um, don't start with we just want to manage our liability. Mm. Um, <laughs> and, and I think you just need to think about that. Like, there's two buckets of employees you might be dealing with. If you're dealing with in, with new employees, absolutely, there's contractual provisions you can put in place to try and protect yourself even more. 
we're talking about a provision which expressly entitles you to recover the casual loading paid as a debt if the employee ever brings a, a claim against uh, the employer saying they're permanent. So there's things you can put in place. Now, that makes sense for new employees. If you have existing staff who've been with you for a really long period of time, uh, approaching them with a new contract might just be triggering a claim that doesn't currently exist. Mm. So, so whilst we've had a number of clients come to us and say, oh, should I, should I distribute this now? Now's probably not a great time to give it to your existing staff when the law might change. There's a lot of um, media attention on this issue at the moment. Employees might be um, prompted to question why you're introducing the contract. You might be better off actively monitoring the scenario and then introducing something at the beginning of the next financial year or when a new enterprise agreement comes into place or whatever the case may be. So, so you should just be thinking, I shouldn't necessarily have a knee-jerk reaction to approach someone who's been casual and working for me for the last eight years. It, it really requires a more nuanced and tactical approach than that. Having said that, it's uh, you know, the 11th of June and the 1st of July is coming up. and so people, that might be the... People normally do pay reviews at that point in time. And so, um, and there's a, a, a usually an award increase and a minimum, yeah. minimum wage increase. Um, uh, the government had suggested that that would be um, delayed and perhaps staggered, a staggered increase if there was going to be an increase. I know the ACT, you were asking for a 4% increase or the equivalent of $30 a week based on the um, federal minimum wage. Um, but that, that that's an opportunity. Mm. You could do it mid-year um, in yep. accordance with 1st of July, um, updating people's salaries. But again, I think there needs to be a degree of transparency. Um, I, I, people will, um, particularly if we're putting an onerous provision in there like... Um, uh, recovering. You know, recovering, load. yeah. Well, where it becomes a debt, mm. you know. Um, look, it, it's just another way to say what we had already been putting in the contracts. It's a different angle. Um, and it's potentially, we think it's a legitimate one that, that businesses may be able to rely on. Um, but whatever you do, you need to eventually start rolling out new contracts. Yeah. Um, oh, the other thing I just, just before we move on, because I think this is the end of this, this part, before we move on to the reforms, I just wanted to say one last thing, and I've said this before, you really need to be asking yourself a question, do you need your casuals? Mm. If you need them for the flexibility, then you, yes, okay, that's fine, we understand that, you can't move to part-time and, and full-time. Um, casuals actually cost you more than full-time and part-time employees because there's a, a degree of that loading that is paid to them for the inconvenience of not having fixed hours. So um, you, you do need to, as part of this mitigation, you might want to just think, do we really need, um, do we really need these, these, these people as casuals? Um, if they are regular and systematic casuals who have an expectation of ongoing work, they might be might not be casuals, but they're certainly in a category of employee that has protection against unfair dismissal. Um, and so, uh, you know, they're not disposable employees. They're employees that you need to treat like any other employee. And if you are converting them to permanency or looking to bring on some new form of permanent employment, there is the option for people using enterprise agreements to actually have a flexible permanent worker. I mean, you can have a, a part-timer whose, whose hours might be able to be flexed up to 38 or who, whose hours might be able to be fluctuating, provided you, you perhaps add some type of loading to it in order to pass the better off overall test, you can certainly do that. And indeed, at least two or three awards currently have that provision. There are awards that allow employers to flexibly flex up and flex down mm. part-time provisions to allow part-timers to be engaged with more variation in their hours. So. Look at your awards, particularly if you're a restaurant or hospitality business, you already have very flexible part-time employment provisions. If, if you're not in those industries, then, and, and you are of a size that's using enterprise agreements already, it's something you could actually legitimately introduce into your EAs, which then gives you the flexibility without having to have long-term casuals. So that's, that's another option. Permaflexi. That's right. <laughs> it's, uh, it's something that the... Uh, the New South Wales Business Chamber's been big on and, and is still looking to kind of pursue more broadly in the award, award framework. Well, it would be a, 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 large, a large chunk of the solution mm. if, we could, if we could proceed with that. So we've got some... Uh, when we say upcoming IR reforms, these have not come to a, <laughs> come to a position where we actually have um, detailed uh, answers for each of these um, items. But these are the topics that... Um, that the, the government has identified as being issues that need to be dealt with. Mm. Um, interestingly, we've got some common ground. You've said here we've got casuals and fixed-term employment. 
We've got employment, enterprise bargaining. We've got award simplification, um, compliance um, uh, in terms of um, penalties and the yes. like um, for underpayment or um, the term that I hate, wage theft. Um, and uh, Greenfields agreements is another issue as well. But what's, what's interesting about this list is that a couple of these items, uh, there's common ground with the unions in that they are areas for reform. They just want different things yes. done. So, um, I mean, we've talked a little bit about casuals and what needs to be done there. Um, the uh, fixed-term employment's a little bit of an issue as well in the sense that, um, uh, you know, there's a, um, there was an attempt by the, uh, the I was going to say Shorten government, <laughs> it was um, Gillard and Shorten at the time um, and uh, Rudd, uh, sorry, um, yeah, Rudd came up with the Fair Work Act, of course, and at that time, they came up with um, a they they introduced the unfair dismissal provisions around fixed term employment, and they said, well, you can have a fixed term contract that has a termination provision in the in the explanatory memorandum. They just forgot to put it in the act, and so that 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 was kind of useless. And so that was they thought that they were evolving that that area or that particular type of contract, and it didn't happen. So that might be one thing that mm. that, that would be on the table as well. Um, I don't know if there's anything else to say about casuals, though, is there? I just think it's really encouraging that that's one of the working groups because it means there's a real appetite on the government's part mm. to really fix this work pack and scheme, work pack and Rosado stuff. So the main thing I take out of the first working group is that actually there's a real preparedness to try and fix this this time round. The scheme decision came down, the government did nothing. The Rosado decision comes down, we get told there's a working group predominantly about casual employment. That's a really good development. I think with the fixed term employment, the one thing we're going to see, um, and, and this is an area employers just need to be cautious about and, and monitor closely, is if we do get an expanded um, ability to engage people on fixed term contracts or maximum term contracts, which will enable you to potentially terminate the, the relationship prior to the expiration date, what's the quid pro quo for that? What, what gets given in exchange for mm. that? And, and that's a concern. Um, and so we just want to be, be certain that in exchange for that, you don't end up on, with some you know, limitation on how many fixed-term contracts you can use or some... It, that's what, what might be the, um, the concern about reforming that area. Um, but it is... For some employers, it's a really big deal. For, for others, they don't use fixed-term engagements at all. But um, it's, uh, it's something that's going to be interesting to, and, and a little bit unknown where, where it's heading. Unlike enterprise bargaining, probably. Well, everyone has an issue with enterprise where, bargaining. Where, where I think the positions of um, both the unions and the employers is, is, quite, is quite well known. It's unified in one sense and then polarised in the next. Unified, as Joe said, everyone agrees there's a problem. The solutions are very different. Yes. Um, I, I mean, on the employer side, the... Um, there's clearly an exasperation with the procedural requirements associated with bargaining. Employers not, not, treat, not kind of achieving some particular rule, whether it's about how a notice is issued or um, when a notice is issued or the explanation that's given to employees about a particular agreement. If it doesn't check certain boxes, all of a sudden um, the whole voting process can Full be invalidated. Mm -hmm. and, and that's caused a lot of problems with EAs. Um, I know employers are also somewhat agitated about the fact that unions, and we don't have to beat around the bush, it's the CFMEU, are intervening in approval matters where they've not been bargaining representatives, they don't have any members, and they turn up to oppose the approval of the EA. And this is commonplace. Mm. Uh, they monitor the, uh, the filing of EA applications every day. There's a website on the Fair Work Commission site more generally where they CFMEU have an employee who simply just looks to find EAs that might be of interest to them and then starts typing submissions to oppose it. Yep. And we've had a number of clients who've experienced that. And it's happened with appeals as well. And, and a number of appeals mm. that we're involved in currently which are in, uh, really associated with an intervener who has no actual skin in the game in terms of um, the proceedings or the employees opposing and in some circumstances succeeding in, in killing an EA. Yeah. That's a real cause for concern. In, in, in for fairness to the too. CFMEU, they, they've... They do have a, a legal um, right to have standing, and that's yes. how they get in. But um, your point is, in a practical sense, they're not there representing the employees. They're not there of that particular business. They're not. They're not a party to the agreement. 
um, and and it seems strange that that they would get involved. But it's, that's right. It's a business. It's a that, business for them. <laughs> that's right. And and so I'm sure there's going to be a desire for some reform around that. Um, the the final and sorry boot. Yeah, but yes. boot, boot, boot the boot. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, 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 the well, real I, the, the the issue with the boot though was that we we it, it started out being very concerning. And then everyone got into a bit of a rhythm with the Fair Work Commission. And then the occasional member would miss something. I might be saying that a little lightly. <laughs> but uh, the occasional member would miss something and then there were some embarrassing federal court decisions where the Fair Work Commission, um, well, they may not have been, been embarrassed, but I think yeah. um, uh, generally speaking um, the federal court was critical in the legal sense of the Fair Work Commission and, and had said you're getting this wrong and you're getting all of these things wrong. And um, the, the federal court had taken a very black letter view about how these provisions should be applied and a very technical, um, restrictive view about how they should be applied. And what that meant was that we, we've ended up in, um, we ended up in a period where we had um, uh, members excruciatingly going over the terms and conditions and almost doing a boot term to term in an agreement. So you'd have your agreement, you would lodge your agreement, and the, and the uh, Fair Work Commission member would go through and look at the exact provision in the award and say, that's not better off overall than that. I want to hear you on that point. And then you'd have to go back with a submission about, well, the boot test is actually about better off overall, not just when you compare provision to provision. Um, and it's been quite excruciating. Now, the Commission's eased off on that because they've taken... They, they still come back with a whole range of concerns but they haven't been as pedantic as they went for a while. And I totally understand why they did that, because they, the party, there were parties, mostly the CFMEU, going off to the federal court and um, dragging them up there and getting them, you know, reviewed and, and um, uh, taken to task in the federal court decisions. Um, so that one of the things employers want to look at in that sense is um, they want the boot simplified. Yeah. Yeah. And I think one of the biggest problems with the boot is that the Commission's required to assess the circumstances of each individual employee engaged in the enterprise, as well as each prospective employee that may be engaged. Whereas perhaps a simpler solution is to say that the Commission can assess the EA on a holistic basis overall, whether the EA is better off overall in the award frame than the award that underlies it. And if you're allowed to do that, you can have much more of an evaluative judgment rather than forensically saying, aha, I found one employee <laughs> who's worse off and it kills the entire agreement. Yeah. So that's, that's some of the issues that are going to be looked at. No doubt the unions are going to have other um, concerns about bargaining and, and want to probably increase the scope of bargaining across industry levels. We know that was a, a major facet of the Labor Party's uh, industrial platform leading into the last election. So um, there'll be a lot of discussion around that. Award, award simplifications, um, uh, uh, an issue that we've particularly you, are very passionate about and you've, you've got very specific ideas about how this could be solved. Um, I, I'm, it's been a, I've had a bee in my bonnet about how complex awards are, and they still are, despite the Commission having reviewed, had been through three phases of review yes. um, and, and having, I, th I saw an email this morning saying 18 awards extensively um, reviewed and, and updated. Um, so there's an email out from the Commission today saying, here you go, here's the current... Now, there, there are changes we're aware of, but they're nonetheless issued today. Um, the, uh, so, uh, you know, I, I mean, uh, there, there really is a need here to... Because it's been highlighted through, you know, the fact that pretty much no business, no agency, no organisation in this country is 100% compliant, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I've always said that I can... You give me, a, give me a day or two, I'll go into a business, and even if it's the Fair Work Ombudsman, I'll find they've got a problem. Um, in fact, one of our lawyers who used to work for the Ombudsman back in the day when they were the Workplace Authority got underpaid by them. <laughs> um, so he never made a claim about it. Um, but uh, it, it's, it's impossible to be compliant. And with these penalties that apply to it, they need to look at the penalty regime in that sense or they need to look at the at simplifying the awards. Now, for the government, um, from the government's perspective, it's easier to look at award simplification than it is to look at the penalty regime mm -hmm. because um, the, the Turnbull government increased penalties and toughened up the, the penalty regime. Um, interestingly, so did Howard. And, and part of the reason we've got such a tough penalty regime is because of John Howard. Even though he brought work choices in, people never talk about the fact that he created what we've got now, the, the, the Ombudsman. And um, uh, that has created an environment where we, we've got people that are very easy, easy to prosecute. 
Mm. And, and I think the the award simplification is that there's there's a burning desire for um, a level of of streamlining of the obligations, but I think it's going to be one of the areas which is most difficult to reach consensus on mm. because you're really talking about obligations and entitlements and, and one thing that one party wants is probably going to be completely contrary to what the ACTU might want if, if you're an employer. So it's, I think it's, good, it's the one that's most difficult to predict what the outcome will be. Um, but if there is a simplification, and it, particularly if it's around just allowing parties to agree at flexible, it, agree between themselves on variations provided that, that um, there isn't, you know, material d reduction in someone's kind of, base minimum wages or overtime earnings or something like that, if you can actually just at a workplace level agree on what works for the employer and the employee in a particular individual circumstance, that's what you really want to get to mm. because then it suits the needs of the individual parties. And so I think a lot of focus will need to be on IFAs and actually making them work. Um, and when I say IFAs, I mean individual flexibility arrangements. Um, but we'll just have to see how that one pans out. Um, Interestingly, we've seen, uh, we have seen an, a, a greater uptake in the last few years of individual flexibility arrangements um, or agreements. Um, and, uh, but but for, for a good five, six, seven years, we, we just didn't yeah. see them used much at all. So I totally agree. I think that, you know, there, there's some scope there to, to look at um, souping up the uh, IFAs. Compliance and Greenfields, I think we've talked about compliance a lot mm. already. So mm. I think this is more about the government's the government actually thinks it can be quite firm and tough in terms of uh, underpayments. So they're probably going to be looking to in increase the penalty regime and the regulatory framework with respect to compliance. And Greenfields, for those employers who are interested in project agreements, that's basically all about life of project agreements. Right now, you can have a project agreement which is brand new, you agree with a union, but it can only run for four years. There's been a big campaign run by the Australian Mines and Metals Association primarily to extend that, and lo and behold, it's a it's a topic in the in the work. And that's groups. not going to affect the majority of people on the no, right now. No. So. Um, so yeah, so th those working groups will run from um, either late this month or, or late in mid next month to September 2020. And the idea is that if there are consensus based reforms, they will then be put through Parliament. If there is not a level of consensus, the Prime Minister has said, well, then the government will just get on with the business yep. of. Of, of reform itself. So, I mean, hopefully we take from that that there's going to be in the next six months or so some level of reform on some of these issues. And that's why when we come back to the casual point, whether we get an agreement or we don't, hopefully this is a signal that the government's prepared to do something in this mm. space. Yeah, I, and I think uh, one of the things that... Um, uh, th there will definitely be some compromise, and I think the Labor Party um, took to the last election an idea of having a small claims tribunal out of the Fair Work Commission for underpayments. I have to be honest, I actually think it's a good idea. Mm -hmm. I really do. Um, a, a small claims tribunal usually doesn't involve penalties, usually doesn't involve lawyers too much, but, you know, I always never like to advocate that too much. Um, and uh, look, I think it's a decent idea, and that might be something that, that, that is something that, can, that, that, that comes out of this. There might be a small claims arrangement where people can opt to go through that process because the flip side of the very harsh penalty regime is the fact that it's very expensive yep. and arduous for employees to run those claims. Mm. Yep, agreed. Um, the, the last point we've got here is about um, the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry taking a lead role. Is um, we, we say that because we we work with the we work with the ACCI. Our parent company is um, a member of ACCI, um, and uh, in fact, um, you know the the recent um, award reforms and um, uh, uh, statutory reforms were were um, achieved through a very active involvement through ACCI, and Lewis also had some involvement in that as well. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So we, I mean, it's good. It's one of the unique features of our firm is we, because of our close relationship with with Aki, we have the ability to to kind of advise employers not only on what the law is now, but at least we have a bit of an informed view about where things might be heading. So um, we will wait and see on this space and update you as we go. Um, Roadmap to return. Getting back to the office. So this was, we, we put this up, uh, uh, what, uh, five, six, seven weeks ago? When was it? I can't remember when it was, when you and I came and we, we, we had this in our slide deck. That was the first time we put right, it up. Right, okay, I think yes. it was the day, the day after it was released. 
I remember yep, you saying, yep. we should put this in our slide deck. <laughs> no, I think the reason it confused me, I actually don't think I could turn up because I lost my front teeth. So you actually oh, did it with Nigel. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but I was involved in putting the slides together. Yes, yes. okay. Oh, sorry. You're right, actually, now that you remember. So I do clearly remember you wanting to put this in here. That's what I was associating with it. And then... Um, you are bringing up some, some bad memories. <laughs> yeah, so we need, to, we need to move on. We don't need to go there. Um, yeah, so we, 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 we wanted to put this up because we wanted to revisit this again. And this was the government's agenda and they've largely, they've kept to this agenda effectively. Um, this was their phases. Um, as we've moved through um, these phases, you can see we're moving through now phase two into, um, and we're looking at things that, that are happening in phase three. Um, they're quite broad as they're presented here, um, but everyone was very pleased to hear that the, mm. there's, um, you know, we can all, lots of people can go to the gym from tomorrow. I know there were outdoor classes till today. No, not tomorrow, um, the 13th, on the 13th. So that people were very pleased in New South Wales to hear that. Um, some of the other states have, have loosened up before that and some of the other states are also a little slower to, to follow uh, what we're doing here in New South Wales. Um, but generally speaking, um, we're, we're, when we hit July, um, subject to some recent um, infections in Victoria that mm. have been um, discovered as of yesterday, um, particularly given that we hadn't had any community transmi transmission, I think for about two weeks, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, that, that I would have um, thought that we'll start to see a continued winding back of restrictions um, through July, through into August, um, with some key restrictions maybe in place um, just to, to um, as a precautionary measure for a few months. Yeah, no, agreed. And, and I think from a, um, from a workplace perspective, you've now, where we're at in each state still differs. Um, we're still in a place where most states are encouraging employees to uh, work from home if that's possible, but, but we're no longer in a scenario where it is, it is mandatory to work from home. So you'll see we've got the public health order in New South Wales up as an example. Um, this is a bit further advanced than Victoria, which is still kind of grappling with, with higher numbers of cases. But you'll see that um, where we're at now is that the health minister directs that an employer must allow an employee to work at their place of residence if it's reasonably practical to do so. Now, that that's actually movement for what it was before. Before mm -hmm. it was the employee must work from their place of residence if it's uh, reasonably practical to do so. Now we're at, no, it's just if the employee wants, wants to, it mm. must be allowed. So that's opened up the ability to bring people back to work. And equally, all these social distancing measures in relation to the four square metre rule and the, and the public gathering rules about numbers of people on a premises, they no longer apply to an office building or, or a workplace, as you'll see in the second element of this slide. So you actually can start talking about bringing people back to work, but what you want to be ensuring is that you are doing it in a manner which is minimising risk to health and safety because you, you don't want to be the next health cluster for two reasons. One, you're going to have your, your company's name all over the news. You don't want to be the next New March House. The next, um, or the next abattoir. Or the next abattoir. <laughs> yeah. Or the next Ruby Princess. Yeah. Um, and two, you also have work health and safety obligations. Mm that you might breach under the WHS laws for not minimising risk to health and safety. And so I think that feeds into the question, Joe, is well, what should people be doing in terms of um, safety measures if you are bringing people back? Uh, and I think, um, well, when we get to that, and I think we've got some questions here, so maybe we'll get into that a little bit more with questions, but just coming back to this point, I just wanted to highlight two points you've already said, Lewis, but there are, there are two key words or phrases in this, in this requirement in, direction, in um, provision nine of this order. And that is the word allow mm. and the words reasonably practicable. Yep. Um, they're the two pivots in that, dis, in that, that, that direction. Um, in relation to allow, that's the point that Lewis is talking about. Um, and the reason I want to highlight this, because a lot of the questions are, why can't we require employees to come back to work? And in addressing some of those questions in a global sense, um, the, the first point is, because the term there allow means that there's a subjective element to this, provision, to this provision. And what the subjective element is, that it's up to the employee. If the employee wants to work at home, the only consideration you have after that is, okay, they want to work at home. Now, do I have to allow them to work at home? Yes, unless it's not reasonably practicable for them to work at home. Now, 
Where you're going to have challenges with that is, and this is going to some of the questions are raised here, if they've been working at home for the last 10 weeks, you're going to have to find a way to explain how they can't reasonably, practically work at home now when they could for the last 10 weeks. That's going to be a challenge. This is a huge issue for office-based work. It is. So if you're in a factory, okay, you probably had them there most of the time, but I agree 100%. Most office-based workers have proven in our experience and the clients we're speaking to that they're actually quite good at working from home, <laughs> to everyone's surprise. Yes. Um, and that's going to be a huge hurdle, for, it, if there's any dispute. It, it is, and, and I think there's a range of ways you can deal with this, and it's going to, there's no one-size-fits-all and there's no easy fix for this. Uh, but what I think you need to do is you're going to have to spend some time thinking about the issues. Um, some of the issues you'll think about is mental health. Mm. Um, the reality is that um, everyone who's been working in an office for however many years they've been working in an office, and Lewis and I have been working in offices for, you know, decades now, and me a decade longer than him, um, the, um, uh, the moving now to working from home permanently, being forced to work, to mo to move from, to work from home has created an environment where people are... Um, suffering a little bit, you know, mentally from that. Um, it is having an effect on people. So that's one avenue you might want to focus on. You might want to spend some time understanding whether or not it's actually in the best interests of the person's health and safety to be working from home full time. That's, that's the first issue. Um, that's still not a simple fix for it. Yep. The second issue is also um, how has the social um, and cultural cohesion in the office, how's that going? Because um, I can tell you that Lewis and I know that on all of these items, um, that those are considerations for us in our office. Mm. And there has de while, whilst people are still productive, um, you, you, your work is not just about doing the work. It's also about working in a place that you enjoy working at. Mm. Um, it's working with people that you enjoy working with. And that feeds into a broader strategy around culture and advancement of your business. It's not just about what work you've got to do today or next week. It's about what this business is going to be doing in three, four, five years' time. So it is about business strategy. And so this might involve a process of you looking at all of these items, the health and safety component, looking at the um, cultural component, um, looking at, at the strategic component around the workplace, and whether or not these things feed in. Um, and it will involve not a simple decision, but a process of engaging with your staff and working through each of these issues so everyone becomes aware of them, has time to think about them, is consulted about them because it's a health and safety matter. Got to consult with your staff about that. And then starting to, um, uh, uh, you know, disseminate the concerns you have amongst your staff so that they start to understand that you've got a concern about these things. And then you might even be able to get some hard data on this stuff. Mm -mm. Um, so that, that, those are some ideas that we've got around how you might start to look at whether or not working from home on a permanent basis um, is, is something that you can maintain. But for the time being, um, it's a real challenge. It's a real challenge. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think um, if you are going to bring people back, and I think this is on our, on our next slide, um, the things you need to be then doing with your staff is assessing risks, Things that you might want to think about are placement of sanitizers. Um, things, other things you might be thinking about is social distancing in terms of desk spaces, um, physical separation, all of those things. And you should actually ensure that someone's going to go through um, with almost like a checklist and you want to document this saying these are the risks that we think exist to contam contagion or, or level of communication of, of COVID-19 or other illnesses. And really, it applies to any illness. I mean, people, when you think about it, we probably should have been doing this a lot more proactively in the past. Um, and, and then say, OK, well, ways we can mitigate against this risk is, is desk separation. Um, is there going to be a kind of roster of how many people in the office at once? Uh, lift spacing, signage to draw people's attention to things, uh, accessibility of hand sanitizers and, and wash facilities, all those things. And then, as Joe said, you consult with your staff about that. You consult with them about what you're doing. And then I'd be putting in place a procedure explaining what's expected. And the biggest thing about WHS that you cannot forget and that often people do forget is that you have an express obligation under the Act not only to risk minimise in your business but to consult with other pe businesses or other people who have undertakings that interrelate with your business. So if you're a company, you don't just sort out your floor. You've got to talk to your landlord. You've got to talk to your facilities manager. 
and the other businesses to ensure what they're doing and how they work together. And the same might um, relate to how you engage with contractors, suppliers, clients. The, I think there's five manifest obligations in the, in the WHS laws that are called out. Each of them express overarching obligations and the last is to consult with other persons conducting businesses and undertakings that in, interact with your own. And so just don't forget to include them in the discussions. Yeah, very important. And some of the questions we got were um, centred, some of the questions we've got here are centred around um, consulting with your building owners um, mm. and your landlords um, and your building managers. That's really important to consult with them. Um, some of the questions were around, well, how do we get them to, um, you know, conduct more cleaning? And, well, if they don't want to spend money on cleaning, how do we, you know, um, how do we protect our staff? You do need to think about reasonably practicable measures that you can implement to protect your staff. What that, what that is will depend on yep. um, what, what arrangements you've got in your workplace. Lewis has already talked about some of those things. We won't go over them again. Um, those are the things you need to be thinking about and probably more depending on your business. I think we're... And this oh, will answer some questions yeah. as well. Um, so, um, and I realised we, we were going to get to the questions we've got, we've, but we've dealt with a, a bunch mm -hmm. of these questions by answering some of these um, or dealing with some of these points in quite some detail. Um, if an employee feels unsafe to present to work, we're getting this a lot. Yeah. Um, I know there's a suspicion on behalf of some employers that um, that employees are um, just sort of taking the mickey mm -hmm. and staying at home um, and they're sort of taking their JobKeeper payment and they're sitting at home, you know, on the, on the 750 bucks a week. Um, not that that's a, you know, a lottery win or anything, but um, there, there's a feeling about that. I, I, I said this when Nigel and I spoke about this particular issue. Uh, I, I want to impress upon employers to just be very cautious and very understanding of the likely mental state of your employees. They are probably paranoid, um, the vast majority of them. Um, not the ones going out and protesting on the weekend that they, or during this week. They're, they're not paranoid. <laughs> um, but the, the, there are a very large portion of employees who are... Um, uh, not unjustifiably paranoid about being infected. They're worried about their kids. They're worried about their parents. They're worried about not just themselves, but other people they may infect. Um, and they're watching TV and they're seeing what's happening in America with, with the infections and, and in other countries, and they're very concerned about it. Please start from that position, and then you can work through these things. Mm. Um, and the first thing is, has the employee provided some sort of medical evidence? If they're claiming they're ill, um, you know, have they provided yep. you with a medical certificate? They can ring up and get a medical certificate from the doctor now. Um, there, there's a question in here that talks about, well, um, I've got an employer who keeps just providing medical certificates, unfit for work, unfit for work, unfit for work. Right. Um, that's the point at which you can start asking, what is actually wrong? Mm. What is wrong with you? Because you've been away for five or six weeks. Maybe don't use the tone I just used. Mm. Um, use a really nice tone. I hope you're okay. I hope you're really well, well get, getting better. Um, you know, I, I really, what we're going to need to know is, because you've been away for five weeks or six weeks, we really need to understand exactly what's wrong with you, what treatment you've had, um, what treatment you might need when you come back and whether or not there's any adjustments we need to make for your return. So you can start asking those questions and start requiring those questions and you might end up going down the path of asking for a medical report if it's a very, compl if it's a very um, concerning situation. There is a more general situation raised in one of these questions and that is, um, what if the employee's just sitting at home saying, I'm too stressed? Mm. And, and, and I think that's a really interesting question because you've got a whole range of considerations. Well, one, um, is the stress actually an, an anxiety condition that's affecting their ability to present? If it is, you might want medical certification of that, that they're unfit. But then that's a, that's a personal leave issue initially. And then the question becomes, well, if they're saying oh, no, I'm just stressed because I don't want to come into the office. Well, that might not be a medical condition. It might be, well, why are you stressed? Is it because you don't think our measures are adequate? Well, you need to understand and consult with them about well, what measures do you have concerns with? We've satisfied ourselves that we've taken all of these precautions that are appropriate. And, and if, you, if you have identified to them that you, and you've obtained from them the risks, that, that they are concerned about and you've identified the mitigation strategies you've put in place and they're still not prepared to present for work. Well, unless they have a medical condition, that might lead to issues for them in terms of unauthorised absence, potential discipline, so on and so forth. Um, ultimately, if you have an employee who just 
seems to be not presenting for work for an indefinite period on account of stress or anxiety, you're going to get to the point Joe's already talked about before, which is well, we might need medical reports mm. and assessments about their actual suitability for ongoing employment. But when that word stress comes up, you need to be careful early to just understand what the issue is and to start trying to categorise it. Is it actually I'm apprehensive about the measures and I think they're not appropriate, and in which case you have to have a discussion about that, or is it actually we're talking about a medical condition? Um, and I think what Lewis has just said largely deals with the points that we've raised on the screen here, except the last one, which is um, the point about, um, uh, you know, just be careful. Um, there's an increased risk here around health and safety and in indirect discrimination. Um, now, we might just quickly um, deal with a couple of casual questions. I know we're sort of almost pretty much out of time. Um, there's a question here, um, which I think we've answered already, but um, in part, can, casual, can, can employees choose to remain casual and sign something waiving entitlement to part-time structures? If required to, to pay back holiday entitlements, et cetera, is it calculated at the full-time equivalent of the casual rate that they've been paid? So it, it's, an in, it's a great question because it goes to the heart mm. of the decisions, mm. which is you can't really sign anything designating what someone's employment is. So no matter what you sign... Can't agree. You, you can't agree they're casual because the court will always look at the full substance. But I think the latter part of the question really starts to talk about some of the mechanisms we're looking at, mm. which is well, well, what you've proposed there might not work, but... We think there is an ability to agree on a regime in the contract whereby debt is created linked to the casual loading if the employee makes a claim for recovery of unpaid permanent entitlement. So there is something that might be able to be done there with the second part of the question. Um, there's a, uh, another question here which is a good one, sort of crosses over JobKeeper as well. We, we offered casuals JobKeeper regular and systematic. Um, I think what that meant was they were regular and systematic, mm. so we gave them, gave them JobKeeper. Um, does this mean that we need to offer them casual conversion if we recognise them as regular and systematic for JobKeeper? Well, most, uh, most employers that are covered by awards will now have casual conversion clauses that say for a regular and systematic employee, at either six months or 12 months, you need to notify them of their right to convert to permanency. If you have acknowledged them as regular and systematic for JobKeeper purposes, you will most likely need to notify them that they have this right yep. to convert. You can still have reasonable business grounds to refuse the conversion, mm. but you, you will have conversion obligations under the award. So I'd certainly be ensuring that you're complying with that. Um, there was a question here. I won't, I won't ask that one. Um, we've, and we've answered that one. That one's the regulatory one. <laughs> um, is there, ah, oh, this one's a good one. This one's one we talked about before. Is there any limit on the retrospectivity of this decision? What is the Australian government likely to do? Are there any ways to mitigate the effects on business? I, lo I love it oh, when retrospectivity comes out because everyone's innate reaction is, well, you can't, these thing, changes can't affect the past because it's unfair. Um, surely it's only this point onwards that all these laws apply. Not to them. The, the, the court decision is explaining to us how the law works under the Fair Work Act. And so that goes back, to the very least, to, to 1 January 2010. To be honest, probably before, but it, in effect, it's really saying um, under, these, under this legislation that's now operated for 10 years, this is who a casual is and this is who a casual isn't. Which means that if you're concerned that the decision has an impact, that your casual may not be casual, it, it goes back historically. And they may have been permanent for the last five years or the last 10 years. And when people talk about limitation periods of six years um, for underpayment claims, if your employee is still employed with you, then there's no limitation on their claim, at the very least, to, to unpaid leave entitlements because those leave entitlements are meant to continue accruing. Um, so the, the, any kind of concern or any kind of avenue you might look to explore to say that, oh, this only applies from this point mm. onwards, that's not available. Equally, if there's a, legisl a legislative fix, though, unfortunately, it's likely that if they're going to change the definition of a casual employee, it will Might only work prospectively. Mm. It's, not, it's not often that the government legislates retrospectively. Mm. Um, there's some prospect that they'll do it here, but um, and I know that uh, Christian Porter expressed some real concern about the potential liabilities. I think they talked about $12 billion. Someone else talked about $8 billion. Yeah. Um, there, there's, there's a lot of, there's, there is a concern there, so it is something being considered, but 
we don't want you to get your hopes up about it. No, no um, exactly. We're not sure the government will do that. Well, Lewis, I think that brings us to the end of our session. Um, thank you for joining me today. Thank you. Um, everyone, thank you for joining us and um, stay tuned for our um, next update. Um, we'll no doubt um, in a couple of weeks' time come back to you with uh, hopefully uh, restrictions that have been wound back a little bit further. Yes, yeah. exactly.